In Great Britain, members of parliament resign in disgrace due to abuse of taxpayers' monies. On Wall Street, CEOs lose their jobs while their companies disappear. And on Main Street, homes are foreclosed, businesses are shuttered, and the world economy retreats from a near meltdown. What has happened in recent months? What do these and other stories tell us about ourselves and our times? Is there more to these stories than just money and finance? I think so. We are seeing problems that are spiritual in nature. That's right, I said spiritual. There's more here than meets the eye. Stay with us on this edition of Beyond Today while we look into the reality of a crisis of character. Join our host, Darris McNeely, and his guests as they help you understand your future on Beyond Today. Early on the morning of June 5th, 1944, General Dwight Eisenhower rose from sleeping in a small trailer in England with the most important sea to land invasion in the greatest war in history about to occur the next day, General Eisenhower wrote out a note taking full responsibility should the attack fail. This is what it said. Our landings in the Sherberg Harve area have failed to gain a satisfactory foothold and I have withdrawn the troops. My decision to attack at this time and place was based on the best information available. The troops, the air, and the Navy did all that bravery and devotion to duty could do. If any blame attaches to the attempt, it is mine alone. And with that, General Eisenhower folded the note and put it inside his pocket, should he ever need it. The story is told in the book, Ike, An American Hero by Michael Corda. Very interesting book in a general interest way about the story, the life of General Eisenhower. Eisenhower shouldered the burden for the possible failure of what we now know today as D-Day. The D-Day offensive did not fail, but Eisenhower's willingness to take full responsibility if it had illustrated a level of character not seen in people now or then. Dwight Eisenhower commanded total forces in excess of 2.8 million men, yet he never considered the welfare of any of his soldiers' lives lightly. His careful planning, his strong determination ensured victory without excessive slaughter. A lot of men died that day, but by comparison, it was less than other battles and other wars. Character, the essential quality for leadership and for a successful life. In the few minutes with you today, I'd like to discuss the character it takes for you, for me, to navigate the details of each day of our lives. Character is not just for leaders like Eisenhower or others. Character is for all of us. Character defines our lives in small and large ways every single day. In this example of General Eisenhower, we see a man who accepted responsibility for his actions. By writing that letter in advance, he was preparing himself to accept full responsibility for any failure. He would not blame anyone else. He would not blame the weather. He would not blame politicians back home. He would not blame his men. He accepted responsibility and accountability. Responsibility is a word I want you to remember in today's program. It is a biblical concept. It is a biblical quality, and it's a fundamental part of godly, righteous character. Now, going back to the D-Day, essential to the success of that day was not only that of the commander, but also the quality of the men who actually made the assault. Among the troops involved were three airborne divisions, one British and two American. In the days following D-Day, the character of these men would be tried again and again. Their mettle would be tested, and as history now shows, they passed the test. One of the qualities that generation had and has can be summed up in the word character. Major Dick Winters, who was a member of Easy Company, part of the United States Army 101st Airborne Division that was involved in the assault on Normandy, later wrote his observations on leadership and character. And he said this, First and foremost, a leader should strive to be an individual of flawless character, technical competence, and moral courage. Character provides a leader with a moral compass that focuses his efforts on the values we cherish, courage, honesty, selflessness, and respect for our fellow men. American newsman Tom Brokaw referred to the American World War II generation as the greatest generation any society has ever produced. He included in this group not only the soldiers and sailors who fought the war, but those on the home front as well. 
He credits them with making possible the very prosperous society that the United States had in the second half of the 20th century. But it's not just the American generation that was great. England's generation was great as well. The World War II generation in England also revealed people who possessed outstanding character. First of all, they were led by a man who provided a stalwart example and found the words to inspire the British people to follow his example of bravery. That man was Winston Churchill. Unlike their American counterparts, the English civilians found their homeland under attack from the German forces. The Germans had conquered France, and because of its proximity to England, German bombers could easily reach English territory. It was not just the men in khaki who were fighting this war. The civilians, the men, women, and children who had stayed at home were also in the front line. Winston Churchill rallied the people with his, his inspiring speeches, one of which goes like this. He said, we shall not flag or fail. We shall fight in France. We shall fight on the seas and oceans. We shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the air. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. The character of the English people during these times was sterling. This is illustrated in the, in the way that they dealt with severe rationing of goods. Clothing was so severely rationed that people had a certain threadbare look about themselves. Bathing was limited to four inches, four inches of hot water. To save fuel, the meat that they had was rationed to just a very few ounces a week. The average citizen was allowed one egg a month. And fresh fruit of any kind was so rare as to be unthinkable, an unthinkable luxury. Yet, the English people carried on without grumbling. Looking back on the situation, one lady commented, They were traumatic years, what with the raids and the rationing and the restrictions. But they were happy ones. You could leave your door open when the siren sounded and rush to the shelters to find everything intact when you returned. Then there was a loyalty, a compassion for others, and a spirit which I wish was around today. Britain has drastically changed in the past generation. Many lament the lack of values and adherence to a Judeo-Christian religious ethic that puts the responsibility squarely in the center of a moral life. Of course, just talking about the Ten Commandments doesn't make a nation righteous, but there is an argument to be made that when these values are taught, there is a corresponding positive impact upon a people. A good friend of mine, Melvin Rhodes, a frequent guest on Beyond Today and a contributor to World News and Prophecy, one of our publications, recently returned from a two-week visit to his home country. He was talking to us about the change between the 1950s to the 1960s in Britain, which has impacted the changing of the guard of British leadership. He said in the 1950s, the old standards still prevailed. Each school day began with a Bible reading and prayers. On Friday, he says, we ended the day similarly, as if they all needed fortifying for the temptations of the coming weekend, what that might offer. But he says that we were taught the Ten Commandments, and basic biblical principles common to all churches. In short, there was a certain familiarity with the Bible and its principles. But by the middle of the 1960s, all that it was changed. Replacing it were new values that were not really values at all. Materialistic values, money, promiscuity, and a good time became the new gods as the nation rejected the old values, many of which were based on the Bible. Indeed, times have changed. We live in a society today where character has been greatly devalued from the generation of World War II. Perhaps the greatest nosedive dates to the decades of the 60s, a time when the World War II generation, my parents, many of your parents, were working and providing a standard of living that raised the level of society in general. Looking back on the 60s, one historian wrote, For some it's a golden age, for others a time when the old secure framework of morality, authority, and discipline disintegrated. There were massive changes in personal relationships and sexual behavior, a general audacity and frankness in books and in the media and in ordinary behavior. He adds that a general sexual liberation entailing striking changes in public and private morals took place. Character is a spiritual issue. It has spiritual qualities. Our character links to eternal life in the kingdom of God. The booklet we're offering today is The Road to Eternal Life. This booklet outlines the way to eternal life as outlined and revealed in your Bible. You can go online right now to order your copy of this booklet and get your own copy, or you can read it online at beyondtoday.tv 
or you can order your own copy by calling toll-free 1-888-886-8632. That's 1-888-886-8632 or go online to beyondtoday.tv. It's free of charge. It's a booklet that will help you to begin to understand how character links to eternal life. A very important question for all of us. Now let's get back to this issue of accountability and character. Remember the story of Eisenhower I told you at the beginning? Let me give you a more current, up-to-date story. It's December 8, 2008. A young Marine pilot takes off from an aircraft carrier, the USS Abraham Lincoln, on a routine training flight. The carrier is about 90 miles southwest of San Diego, California, on the west coast of the United States. A few minutes into the flight, electrical problems develop. The pilot knows that he's going to have to either eject or the plane is going to crash. He's losing control. He contacts his radio control, his tower, and they advise to him two courses of action. He can either go further north of San Diego to an air station that is there, which would take him across the bay into that air station, or he could go east to Miramar, another uh, major air station for the Navy in Southern California. But going to Miramar will take him over the populated suburbs of San Diego. He calculates, talks with his controllers, and then ultimately makes a decision. He goes from Miramar over the populated additions. He thinks he has enough time to, to, to do that as he goes out over the city. A few minutes later, the electrical systems completely die on his jet. He has to eject. Before doing so, he aims it for a canyon that he sees in the distance, thinking that it will crash into the canyon where there's nobody living. He ejects, he survives, the plane crashes, but unfortunately not where he thought it would. It crashes into a neighborhood, destroying two homes, but it destroys more than the homes. Four people are killed. A mother, her aged mother, and her two small infant children. Four people die. The neighborhood is up in arms. They can't figure out how this happened, how the Marines let this happen, or how modern technology could fail, and how this could take place over a populated area, and these innocent people die in a fiery crash. The Marines call an inquiry. They go into a study of exactly what happened along every step of the way. It takes several weeks. Finally, a report is issued, and people are gathered around their television sets in San Diego, especially the servicemen and the people connected very closely who've been watching this tragic case over the last few weeks to find out exactly what the Marines will do with one of their own, in their own investigation of their case. Will they cover up? Will they give someone a pass? Let me read to you from a report. It says that they could not have been tougher or more damning. The crash, said Major General Randolph Alice, the assistant wing commander for the 3rd Marine Aircraft Wing, the crash was clearly avoidable. The result of a chain of wrong decisions. Mechanics had known since July of a glitch in the jet's fuel transfer system. The F-18 Hornet should have been removed from service and fixed, but was not. The young pilot failed to read the safety checklist. He relied on guidance from Marines at Miramar who did not have complete knowledge or understanding of his situation. He should have been ordered to land at North Island. He took an unusual approach to Miramar, taking a long left loop instead of a shorter turn to the right, which ate up time and fuel. Twelve Marines were disciplined. Four senior officers, including the squadron commander, were removed from duty. Their military careers are essentially over. The pilot was grounded for a period of time as the board reviewed his future. The Marines didn't shirk their duty. They took responsibility. This wasn't damage control, as the article goes on. It was taking honest responsibility. And as such, in any modern American institution, it was stunning. Someone had to be responsible. Someone was responsible for the crash of that jet and the death of those innocent people. And when that happened, these people took the responsibility that was theirs to take. That is something that's rare today. We've been going through a financial crisis. I mentioned the, the graft of members of parliament in Great Britain. America's had its own financial collapse in recent months that has impacted the, the entire world's financial system. How many CEOs 
How many board members of the banks, of the financial houses, of the great corporations that had to go into government receivership or government ownership, how many of them stood before the cameras and essentially said, we screwed up? The buck stops here. It's our responsibility. We are to blame. I don't recall hearing anything like that. Maybe it happened, maybe I missed it, but I honestly don't recall a lot of it if it did happen. I do recall multi-million dollar bonuses being paid out for executives who were part of these failed financial firms. I read a lot of things that disturb me and tell me that people just don't take responsibility for the, their actions today. They don't learn the lessons of the past and perhaps something deeper is a, a, at the problem and at the heart of these problems that we see in, in our American society. It's a problem of responsibility and accountability. It's a problem of character. It is something that we just don't have as part of our world and of our life today as much as we would like to see as things, as events, as these stories that are in front of our headlines every day tell us. We want to blame others in the past. We want to blame a past president, a past administration for the, the economic problems that are there today and others who are the leaders and all the way down to the individuals on Main Street don't always want to take the responsibility that perhaps it was greed, perhaps it was making a wrong decision here and not taking responsibility for our own actions that have left us in the mess that we have today. Not a whole lot of people have, you see, written that letter or written out their thoughts or written out an explanation like Dwight Eisenhower did and put it away or at least admitted the responsibilities that they have had for the actions in which they are involved. This matter of character and responsibility is a very important one for our lives. We're going to take a break for a commercial. We're going to come back and then we're going to talk with the Beyond Today panel about more of these incidents and how this can be turned around in our own life. So stay with us. We'll be right back with the Beyond Today panel. How many roads lead to salvation? Can you earn it by living well and doing good? Or do you need only to call on Jesus' name? Jesus said many would come along who wear the Christian badge, who preach in his name, who accomplish great wonders in his name, but who are not on a road to eternal life. In the end, Christ can only tell them, I never knew you. Salvation is not a paycheck you earn or a password you say. These roads are man-made, and you can't build your own road to God. He built one to you. Open your Bible and discover the process of repentance, baptism, forgiveness, and transformation God has designed to bring you to Him. For help finding biblical answers, read our study guide, The Road to Eternal Life, at beyondtoday.tv or request a free copy by calling 1-888-886-8632. That's 1-888-886-8632. There are many roads, but Christ prepared one for you. Make it yours. Does God really exist? Scientists now say you can prove it. What's the best way to rear your children for success? Questions need positive answers to the world's greatest issues and your personal ones as well. That's what you'll get when you get your free subscription to the Good News Magazine. Call toll-free 1-888-886-8632. That's 1-888-886-8632. Or go to beyondtoday.tv for your free subscription. You'll be glad you did. And we are back to Beyond Today, our program, A Crisis of Character. You just saw a message for the Good News Magazine, which if you go online to beyondtoday.tv, you can order a free subscription, one-year subscription, which is six issues to this quality family publication that will go into many different topics, but specifically into topics that deal with character, the very subject that we are exploring in today's program. In fact, this particular issue covers articles on marriage, how to relate to one another in a good marriage, and also dealing with your own personal finances. The Good News Magazine, free publication, online at beyondtoday.tv. I'm joined with our Beyond Today panel. Gentlemen, this subject of character today, we've tried to kind of whittle it down to the one concept of responsibility and, and being accountable for one's actions. From a biblical perspective, can you define personal responsibility and accountability? Well, you know, there's a quote that I use in my life. In fact, I brought, I knew we were going to be talking about responsibility. It's from William Bennett's uh, The Book of Virtues. Mm -hmm. And he states, in the end, we are answerable for the kinds of persons we have made of ourselves. That's just the way I am is not an excuse for inconsiderate or vile behavior, nor is it even an accurate description. For we are never just what we are. 
We become what we are as the persons by the decisions that we ourselves make. And I think that is a biblical principle. We are an accumulation of our own decisions. And so that's what responsibility is. It's taking uh, ownership of your own decisions. If, if we're going to take personal responsibility, it means we're going to be reliable for the things that we do. It, it would be just the opposite of blaming someone else or saying it's somebody else's fault. And th that's such an opposite thing as if what we see in society today. Everybody wants to say, well, it's not my fault. They did it or it's their fault or they, they caused this to come about rather than people doing what's right and doing it repeatedly, being dependable. In fact, uh, uh, Gary quoted William Bennett. I heard an interesting quote from Shaquille O'Neal, the basketball pa player. Yes. Shaq said, you are what you repeatedly do. And it's a simple, straightforward, you know, approach. But that's reliability. This is what I do. This is who I am. And we need to take responsibility for the things that we do. And what we repeatedly do is make choices. Life is really just an accumulation of a, a great number of choices but that are in front of us. Well, even in the Bible, in Deuteronomy, God told ancient Israel, choose you this day. Good or evil. Choose life. I choose life. It comes yeah. down to actions, isn't it? It's actions. What am I doing? It's not just what I think or what I feel. Oh, I feel this. Well, the, the good intentions, where are they going to get you? They're not going to get you anywhere unless you follow through and they become actions and you are what you do. You take responsibility and you, you, know, you deal with it. Move on if you made a mistake and do what's right. Really, taking responsibility is the first step toward a biblical repentance or changing, which is really the first step toward a relationship with God that leads to eternal life. And it's not easy. No, it's not. It's not easy. Emotionally, we don't want to take responsibility. We want to find some other reason, some other person to blame. You know, I read a lot of books, as I brought out this one about General Eisenhower at the beginning, and I also look for examples of character and leadership to try to study and understand and, and emulate. I'm always reading about how they take responsibility for their actions. From a biblical perspective, what are some examples of either men or women from the Bible who uh, showed this quality of taking responsibility for their actions? Well, the first one that comes to my mind is, is King David in ancient Israel. A remarkable man, had a, a lot of abilities, greatly used by God, and also made some great mistakes in his life. And they're recorded for all people to read. And the, one of the reasons why is when he made those mistakes, he took responsibility. He took ownership. I think of the time when he committed adultery and had a man murdered. And when confronted by one of God's servants, he didn't say, well, let me explain why. He simply said, I have sinned. And he truly went to God and said, I was wrong. No explanations. And he took responsibility. And because of that, he changed. Yeah, the interesting part is taking responsibility and, and doing what's right then. When you, you talk about a matter of character, the character is when, when it's pointed out that we're wrong and we understand the right way that we do those things. I think of the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was, of course, Saul before he was converted, before God opened his mind to the truth. And what did he do? I mean, he hauled people, true Christians, God's people. He hauled them to Jerusalem in chains. He bound them up, probably participated in people's deaths. And yet, when God opened his mind, he turned around, he understood the truth, and he did it, became the Apostle Paul. And even in spite of the fact, probably uh, wrote most of the New Testament, responsible for so much of the Bible, he, he still, even at that time, said, I am the least of the apostles. He still kept the frame of mind that, that he had room to grow. And he accepted the fact that he, he's done wrong and wrong. And when he did, he changed. And what a remarkable thing when we begin to see how we react to that. Well, you can never change. You can never really change until you take responsibility. Right. Until you see, I need to change. I am wrong. Now growth as a person, emotionally, spiritually, mentally, actually can take place. And that is the first benefit, fruit, if you will, yes. of taking responsibility. Yeah, right. and there's almost a sense of uh, being submissive. That, that, that you're not the be-all and end-all of everything. You're not God. Right. You're not God. That God knows better than you do. And, and so I think that's part of, part of it as well. You know, one of my examples that I go to and, and I like to think about, it's one of my wife's as well, is that of Esther, the young Jewish woman at the Persian court, uh, one of the wives of the Persian king at a time when the Jewish people were being persecuted and uh, their whole existence was at stake. And the man, Mordecai, came to Esther and, and told her that you're here and you're in that unique position for a very special time and, and it's to save your people and you've got to step up. And she took responsibility for her people's welfare at, at, her own, at great risk to her own life and entered the king's presence and set in motion the events that did 
spare the people at that at that time, but she could have shirked it. She could have walked away from it. And lots of lots of interesting examples. What steps can our audience, a listener, take from to develop a, a healthy approach to individual responsibility? First of all, you have to come to a, the realization you don't have control over everything. In fact, there's a lot in life we don't have control over. So you have to say, what do I have control over? And it's our response. That's what responsibility is. It is responding. That's not always easy. I mean, especially if you've been abused. I mean, bad things happen to us all the time. And emotionally, that's very difficult to work through. So what you must believe is that there is a right way of dealing with things. You have to learn the right way. And no matter how difficult, choose the right way. Choose the right way to respond. Yeah, I think that when you talk about character involved in those things, when bad things happen, you know, if, if there are difficulties, there's trials, there's abuse, whatever it is, rather than just looking at it from that perspective, saying, well, it's not my fault, what can I do, it is to, to see the situation for what it is and realize there's a better way. God has a plan, and so you have faith in that plan, and then go about and change your actions change what you can change and go on from there and realize that God has something planned for you that's that's great and put that into practice and make make actions not just simply faith but you know have works like James talked about many of the problems we see in our world today are, are the result of people not taking responsibility for their actions many of the things that you and I struggle with in our own lives continually are as a result of again us not taking responsibility and accountability for what we decide and what we do quit blaming others turn to our inside, turn to God, accept that responsibility, change character begins at that point. We'll be right back for a final word. How many roads actually lead to eternal life? Which one did God build? Open your Bible and discover the process of repentance, baptism, forgiveness and transformation God has designed to bring you to Him. For help finding biblical answers, read our study guide, The Road to Eternal Life, at beyondtoday.tv or request a free copy by calling 1-888-886-8632. That's 1-888-886-8632. Christ prepared one road for you. Make it yours. Character is one of those hard terms that is difficult to discuss, challenging to build, and a lifetime spent maintaining. In our modern permissive world, it is not discussed in many circles, but it is an important part of your life. On Beyond Today, we hold the Word of God as the guidebook for life. It's filled with examples of character and integrity beginning with that of Jesus Christ. There are many reasons this book has endured through the ages. One of the main reasons is the stories of people of character, men and women who lived good and godly lives against great opposition, people who chose the right and good way over the wrong and evil. Make your choice for the good and the right. Choose character that endures for a lifetime. Choose God's way and live. For Beyond Today, I'm Darius McNeely. Thanks for watching. For the free literature offered on today's program, go online to beyondtoday.tv. Please join us again next week on Beyond Today.